you ever felt like, I know what God's promises are. I know what he's going to do. Why is he doing all these other miracles? Do something, God. I need you to do something in my life. He was, Jairus was going crazy. He was desperate. But Jesus went with him. Here's what it says in verse 23. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. Isn't that awesome? (laughs) That can be said without sinning. Jesus said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, Jesus went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. Jesus came at the right time. Jesus came with healing. And he entered Jairus' desperate position, and he did something. God moved at the right time in the right place. When we're desperate, we need to remember where to go for our help. Our help, our answer is in Jesus. Let's remember that. We've got to go after him sometimes. Sometimes it takes that step. You've got to push your way through the crowd and get towards Jesus. He's the one with the answer. Our focus, the thing that we're focusing on, determines our path. There's a really good example of this. I'm going to come down by you. There's a really good example of this in Charles Blondin. Do any of you history buffs or trivia buffs know who he was? This was a guy who was famous in the 1800s for tightrope walking. Yeah, a little before our time. But he was pretty famous because of this one feat. He decided it'd be really cool to tightrope across Niagara Falls, which, if you don't know, is almost a mile across. And not only that, but it's 172 feet tall from where that water starts to fall down. Then there's 200 more feet of water underneath that. And Charles thought it would be cool to just walk across on a little rope. But he did just that. He made it all the way across. And once he got there, of course, everyone was waiting to congratulate him. And they asked him, what in the world gave you the confidence to do this? What gave you the courage to cross that whole way that high in the air? And Charles said, it was simple. I just did what I do every time. Every time I walk in a tightrope, I put a big star on the opposite side And all I have to do is look at it. And as long as I keep my eyes focused, I walk straight down the path I need to go and I never stumble. It's when I look away that I start to stumble. But when I keep my eyes focused, I go in the right way. The same thing is true for us. We've got to keep our eyes focused because when we get desperate, we fall back to the things that we're comfortable with. We fall back onto our habits. And so we need to make our habits even before we get to those times, we need to consciously make our habits going after God. It's so easy to go in another way. And I'm not telling you that every other thing that you could possibly look at is sinful. But there are things that point us to God and there are things that point us away. We need to make that effort and even take the time. Sometimes it's a sacrifice of time. But we've got to do it anyway because those things push us in the right direction. And then when we get desperate, We know which way we need to go. It's already comfortable. We know we're headed where God wants us to be. Paul says it really well in Philippians. In Philippians 4.8, he says, we need to focus on things that are true, things that are noble and praiseworthy. Set your mind on those things, because those things that we fill ourselves up with bring us in a certain direction, and we want those things to bring us towards God. What could be more important? It's so easy to spend our time on other things, but when we make that conscious choice, we start going in the right direction where God wants us to be, which is a whole lot more important than where we feel like being, right? There's another good analogy in the three kids that were having a contest. They tried to see who could run in the straightest line. And of course, this was up north where I'm from, so there was actually a layer of snow and you could see where you were going. And these three kids each had a different plan. The first one said, I'm just going to keep in line with the road. It's straight. It's right next to me. As long as I stay the same distance away, I'll be good. And so he kept running and looking where the road was, looking back to see if he was going straight. 
And the second kid was looking between the other two. And he thought, I don't know how to do this. I'm just going to follow them. As long as I stay in between, I'll be fine. And so he kept adjusting his course to where these other two kids were at. The last one, of course, thought, that's my goal, that's where I need to get to, so I'm just going to run for it. And he ran towards it, and when they turned around, those first two lines were all janky. The last line is the one that was straight, because he was following after the goal. We need to remember what our goal needs to be. We need to make our goal consciously, with the effort, making our goal Jesus, every time, consistently. And it takes time. It takes persistence. Sometimes it lasts longer than we want it to. But we've got to do it constantly, making Jesus our goal. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It matters what we put inside ourselves. It matters what we focus on. So how do we apply this? It's a Sunday school answer. You guys know the answer. (laughs) We spend our time on it, right? We read our Bibles, pray every day, and you grow, grow, grow. That's a good song. There's a lot of truth in it. We need to spend our time on it. We need to stay cross-eyed. I like that phrase. When we stay cross-eyed, we remember who Jesus is. We remember what he did for us. And when we're tempted, it's a whole lot easier to remember what that cost. It's a whole lot easier to remember, I don't want to go after those things. I want to go after Jesus. So stay cross-eyed. Keep your focus on God. It's a whole lot better in the end. Remember what Jesus did. Sometimes we also need to be willing to be made desperate. It's never fun. It's not easy. It's easy to talk about and a lot harder to do. But sometimes we need to be willing to be made desperate. So, you know, in order for something to be on fire, it's got to burn, right? Sounds pretty obvious. But we pray all the time, God, set me on fire. Fan me. If, set the blaze on fire again. I miss that fiery passion that I used to have for God. And then we feel the burn, And then we start to say, God, why are you doing this to me? (laughs) Take this away. What are you doing? But there's a purpose, even in the burn. God uses it every time. And I'm not saying that he wants you to be in pain. I'm not saying that. But as long as there's consequences to sin, he might as well teach us through it, right? He promises that he uses things for our ultimate good. You might not see it on this side of heaven, but God's going to use it for your ultimate good. So even in that burning process, God's transforming you. This is a common analogy. You guys know this too. But when the goldsmith wants to refine that gold, he has to put it into the fire. There's nothing else that's hot enough that's going to melt that gold so the impurities will rise to the top and he can scrape them away. And it's true so often that God just puts the gold right back into the fire. Then he can scrape the rest of the impurities away and puts it right back in and scrapes more off the top. Have you ever felt like God was doing that to you? You were wondering what he was doing. Sometimes it feels like that, but it's that process that God uses to make the gold pure and strong. It's more valuable. It's useful for the goldsmith's purpose when it's pure. And we need to be that for God. Even though it takes that burning process, over and over, God puts us into the fire and he scrapes all those impurities away. He transforms us and makes us into his image through those things. And yeah, it takes some burning. (laughs) It never is fun, but it's worth it. Every time it's worth it. God has a purpose in it all. And I'm not saying God wants us to hurt, but I am saying he uses it every time we can trust that. I also want you guys to know that I'm not just trying to preach at you. I'm really bad at talking about myself, but I felt like God wanted me to share some of my testimony today. And so here it goes. 29 years ago, I won't tell you my whole life story, but when my parents were pregnant with me, they went to the doctor, and the doctors told them, your child has the worst case imaginable of spina bifida. 
there is no chance. Actually, they gave them a 0.3% chance that I would survive 24 hours. They said if by some miracle she lives longer than that, she's going to live her whole life in a wheelchair. She's going to be in pain. She's going to have such physical and mental handicaps that her life will be miserable, the entire thing. And not only that, but she will make everyone's life around her miserable because they'll have to just take care of her. You guys can't handle this. It's best for everyone that you just go through with an abortion. And obviously, my parents didn't do that. They went home and they got on their knees and they prayed and they asked God for healing. And God answered their prayers. Praise God, I was born with not a single one of the things that the doctors said I was going to have. Amen. Amen. He answers our prayers. He hears us. He knows it when we're desperate. He's been there. So fast forward 23 years. I was in the same position. I was at the hospital listening to a doctor tell me there was no hope. I went home and I got on my knees because I knew what God was capable of. I knew he could heal, and I asked him for healing. I've been there. God did not answer my prayer in the same way. The year after that, the same thing happened all over again. Nick and I have two children, and they're in heaven. For several years, it seemed like every few months, I would get a phone call, and I kept hearing... Your best friend just committed suicide. Your friend just died in a car accident. Nick's grandpa died in a house fire. With the, we watched his house burn down, knowing to the last day he had refused to listen to us talk about God. I'm not going to go through it all because I can't, but you guys, I'm telling you, I know what it feels like. But I also know. That's a big but. I also know what God has done through it. I know what God has done in me, how he's changed me and transformed my life because of it. And I know how he has gotten me to talk to all kinds of people about him and how good he is through all of it. It's worth it. I can't say I'm happy about it all, but I can tell you it's worth it. God is going to do something. And maybe he's going to do it in you. And maybe he's going to do it through the worst things that you've been through. But God is able. And he's faithful. And he's going to do something. Through all of that, my favorite verse has become Daniel 3.18. Do you guys remember what that verse is? uh, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were facing the fire. And the king said... I'll give you another chance. You don't have to die. All you have to do is bow down. That's it. It's so simple. And these three said, O king, we don't have to answer you in this matter. Our God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, he is still God. And we are not going to bow down to your idols. Even if he doesn't answer your prayer in the way that you want him to, or you think he should, he's doing something. He's working. He's got a purpose. I promise you. We might not see it on this side of heaven, but he's got a purpose and he's going to use it. He uses it to transform us, to create a desperation for him in us. Sometimes we've got to be willing to be made desperate so that we can get pointed in the right direction, so that our desperation turns us towards God and gets us to go after him. You know that verse that says, God will never give you more than you can handle? (laughs) There's some truth in that. God will never give you more. God doesn't tempt us, but he'll never let you be tempted more than you can handle. Never. And God will never give you more than you can handle if you let him handle it because he's God and he can handle it. But God will give you more than you can handle sometimes. 
Maybe you're not feeling desperate right now, but God sooner or later will let you feel that burn because it's that that makes us realize we are desperate without him. We need God to move in our lives. We need a touch from him. And we've got to go after him, even, even if it means pushing our way through the crowd. Even if it means people are going to see us. Even if it means we lose our reputation or our position, whatever. It's worth it. Because in our desperation, desperate situation, he is our God. He is our answer. And he's the only answer. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We need him. We need him to move in us. He's the only way. We've got to go after him. We've got to realize that that fire refines us. And it's worth it even when it takes a burning. That burning creates a fire in us. So are you desperate for him? Because he always answers those prayers the way that we want him to. He promises, you seek me with all your heart and you will find me. Every single time, if you seek him with all your heart, you'll find him. And it might take three hours at the altar. We're not going to keep you here for three hours, but it might take three hours at the altar. Are you willing to sacrifice your time? Are you willing to go after him even when you don't feel like it? It's worth it but it does take persistence. You know, in order for a breakthrough to happen, something's got to break. But sometimes that thing is us. Sometimes we're standing in our own way, and we ask God to break through, but we won't let him. Sometimes we've got to raise our hands in worship, even though we don't think that there's anything worth worshiping for. Even when you don't feel his presence, you still got to go after him. Jesus is coming. Let's go through the crowd. Push your way towards him. Sometimes it takes persistence. Sometimes you got to push in, press in, and keep going. Maybe it's going to take a while, but it's worth it. God's going to do something, but we got to keep going after him. The pressure's on him. It's not like it's us that do anything. The pressure's on God. But he also asks us to take that step. Sometimes it's a literal step. you got to actually stand up and do something. God asks us to take action sometimes. We need to be willing to do it. Sometimes we got to act our way into feeling. It's not, it's not like we're faking it. It's not like we're doing it out of duty. But just like in marriage, how you don't always feel like you're in love with your spouse, Right? Maybe it's just me. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But you still have to act like you're in love with your spouse. You have to act like you love them, otherwise things are just going to keep getting worse. When you act like you love them, it does something. It shows them your love and helps them to love you. But it also reminds you, first of all, that you do love your spouse. It reminds you why you love them. And somehow it just transforms you. It helps you to feel that love again. But sometimes you have to act like it even though you don't feel like it. Sometimes we have to do the same thing with God. We've got to go after him. Do something. (laughs) Make a move and raise your hands in worship even though you don't feel like it. You don't feel God's presence yet? Well, worship him. Let him come and do something. Something's got to break. Let's press in. I want to spend some time pressing in today. Are you desperate for God? Even if you're not, you can spend some time going after him and making him your focus. Make your, him your habit right now so that when you are in those positions, he's already your focus. You're already headed the way that he wants you to go.